Hi, my name is Jane May, and I'm a medical student and president of the International Health Service Collaborative at USF. Dr. John Sinnott is one of IHSC's faculty advisors, and in addition to his many professional accomplishments, he is also a seasoned world traveler. In this presentation, Dr. Sinnott will shed light on the importance of preparation and provide a list of travel essentials to enhance one's readiness for the pitfalls one may encounter while traveling abroad. My name is John Sennett. I'm the Associate Dean for International Affairs, and I'm going to talk to you, future and perhaps present world traveler, about travel medicine. I'm going to have a different slant. I'm going to talk to you as a clinician so you have an idea what to do afield and perhaps have some good tips to ease your travel. We always see these scary things about yellow fever, hepatitis, etc. And of course the dreaded idea of diarrhea while traveling. But actually there's many more interesting facets of travel that we could discuss to make travel both safer and more fun. When we look at travel, I'd like you to look at it as concentrated living. If you're going to engage in concentrated living, I want you to prepare for travel. Research where you're going. Develop a checklist. Write things down as you go. Everyone brings up vaccine recommendations. So of course I'll do that. They change weekly. They're on the CDC website. We'll talk a little bit about malaria prophylaxis. But recall that malaria is very common in returning travelers. It has about a 15% mortality in the United States. Interestingly enough, if you develop it, say, in India, your mortality is less than 1% because doctors are more used to treating it. There's going to be suggestions in this talk about your supply of medications and what you, what you should take with you to function effectively. We'll review safe eating tips. We'll discuss how to treat gastroenteritis and another common complaint, that of sunburn. The scope of travel is immense. Globally, 600 and 700 million people cross an international border. From the U.S. alone, 35 million are going to go to a developed area and about 22 percent will get sick. 17 million, which is vastly increased over five years ago, will go to developing countries. Half of those will get sick. Of all these people traveling so many places, only 3,000 will come back in a body bag. Of those, 2,000 will be motor vehicles, 600 falls, 200 from infectious disease, and 100 miscellaneous. Now this group downplays cardiovascular disease, but this lecture specifically targets medical students and health-related personnel in a younger age group. Obviously in the over 65 group, heart disease would be the leading cause of death. Only 36% of people sought medical advice before travel. This sort of looks at where people go and where they go from. As you see, people in the U.S. are incredibly mobile. They travel to South America, Asia, Europe. If I had to pick a single rule of travel, I'd call it Sinnott's Rule. And in it, I tell people to take twice as much money as they think they need and half as much luggage. When I go abroad, even for two or three weeks, pretty much all of my clothes go in this backpack and a travel coat. If I run into inclement weather, I can often buy clothes there at a far lower cost than I would be able to purchase them in the U.S. Research before traveling is important. You should not leave the United States without reading about your trip. It would be irrational to waste precious travel time and money learning as you go. I've listed here on this slide a number of sources. For Europe, I really want to emphasize Rick Steves as a reliable guide. Elsewhere, the Lonely Planet Guide. Before you begin traveling, I want you to think the trip through. 
Where are you going? Is it developing or is it industrialized? If you're making a journey to Paris, well, I can tell you it's safer, the food is better, you're less likely to get mugged or shot than in the U.S. On the other hand, should you be traveling to, say, Somalia, it would be a somewhat different story. Will you be staying in a western hotel? Will you be backpacking or roughing it? What is the season? Are there extremes of weather? Or will you be exposed, say, to mosquitoes or sand flies? Longer distances involve jet lag, and it usually takes one day to recover from each time zone. And traveling by air, upper respiratory infections are a common occurrence. For this reason, I try to sit with a bulkhead in front of me. If I'm seated next to someone ill, I ask for another seat. If you're traveling by ship, lower respiratory infections, pneumonia, and especially diarrhea are common. For those of you climbing, high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema are definite possibilities, but far beyond the scope of this presentation. If you will be at altitude, it's your duty to read about the effects of altitude on the human body. Before traveling, some people experience anxiety. You can consider stress reduction. I'd like to make another suggestion. Roughly 10% of the people in the United States will have a history of a psychiatric issue. If you're under the care of a psychiatrist, or have seen one in the past, it's often a good idea to check in with your psychiatrist pre-departure. If you have any issues with depression, anxiety, any stress syndromes, these will only get worse abroad. Certainly, you'd want to talk to your regular physician about pre-existing medical conditions such as diabetes, hypochlorhydria, allergies, or immunosuppression. In general, there's a couple things you want to think about. First, the most dangerous thing you're going to be around are cars. Common sense encourages all of us to not drive abroad. Take a taxi, take a bus, take a train. Be careful about falls and be very cautious about swimming, especially swimming and drinking, or swimming and using drugs. Socially, risky behavior includes sexual activity and drugs, which are not only hazardous medically, but can be quite hazardous legally. In general, you want to label your prescription medicines and travel light. The main infections you want to worry about are malaria, and zoonoses, or infections carried by animals. When you eat, you want hot food served hot and cold food served cold. Hot food should be at least 140 degrees. Cold food should be less than 40. I prefer carbonated water since I've specifically seen people filling water bottles from a stream and sealing them with a heat gun. As far as wildlife goes, avoid animals. To deal with pickpockets or theft, put your money in different places. Now what does that mean? Well first, don't put all your credit cards in your wallet. Leave one in the hotel room for backup. Second, put some money in a sock, some money in a, a pocket, and some money in another pocket. Leave your valuables at home. If you have a priceless watch or heirloom, don't take it abroad and leave it at the hotel. Just don't take it. Finally, I think all of you should consider a GSM phone. This is a tri-band phone. You can purchase it for 50 to $70 in your country. You visit, get a SIM card with it, and call anyone you want. But most importantly, keep in touch with your friends and country. In Threats to Travelers, you hear many people talk about 
terrorist acts, kidnapping, etc. If you're not going to the Middle East and you're not traveling to Colombia, kidnapping and terrorism are actually very rare events. What you need to worry about are respiratory infections. You should receive a pneumococcal vaccine, a current influenza shot, antibiotics should be carried by high-risk patients, and if you're traveling in Southeast Asia, you'll find ample signs about avian flu and SARS, which will actually list alert levels. Please pay attention to them. I have trauma as a single word on this slide. Trauma is one of the leading killers of young travelers. I like to say that gravity is the enemy of youth and cars are the enemy of educated people. I want to introduce Feng Wen, a talented medical student who is volunteering with our International Health Collaborative. The next three slides depict an incident that occurred while Feng was volunteering in the Dominican Republic. Feng, why don't you tell us what happened when you and Gravity met in the Dominican Republic? Okay, so while in the DR, our volunteer group visited a river with a waterfall and the local children were jumping off and uh, I decided it would be a good idea to follow suit and this is what happened. My knee met a sheet of rock at the bottom of the river. What happened next, Fong? Well, here I am by the side of the road with our volunteer group and luckily one of our classmates had suturing material with him and since the clinic had no electricity uh, I was getting st stitched up by flashlight. Do you think it would be a good idea to use our checklist next time you go to the Dominican Republic or uh, anywhere abroad? I definitely do <laughs> agree. Thank you very much Dr. Wen. We appreciate all you do for the university. And as Shakespeare said, all's well that ends well. Thank you. I mentioned driving earlier. Suppose you've rented a car and you come across this sign. If you don't know what this sign means, you probably shouldn't be driving the car. Here's another reason not to drive a car. This is a truck. If you look closely, you find the truck has a flat tire on the right, but is also full of dynamite. Again, whenever possible, hire a professional driver. I mentioned pickpockets. Try to carry your wallet in your front pocket. This is an example that happened to me in Thailand, where someone used a razor to cut the back of my pants, and just fortuitously, another individual saw my belongings falling out of my pocket. This is a GSM phone with a SIM card. Note that the charger is appropriate for the country. Many individuals travel with gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn. When you reduce the acid barrier in the stomach, you reduce the number of bacteria needed to make you sick. In general, it takes a thousand salmonella to infect an individual. But with proton pump inhibitors, you can become infected with as few as 10 microorganisms. If you are absolutely dependent on anti-reflux medicine or PPI, why not use half the dose or substitute Tums ran acid for symptomatic treatment during the trip? Our traveler's checklist follows. Number one, label your medication. The only people that really care about your medications are going to be U.S. Customs. So make sure that you have only United States medications and that they are properly labeled. Do not put medicines from one bottle into another. Secondly, for TSA, liquid medications and paste must be in a one-quart Ziploc bag. Each of you should Xerox your passport three times in color. One copy in your wallet, one in your suitcase, and one around your computer or briefcase. The idea is that if a passport is lost and you have a copy with a readable code, a 
at the bottom of the first page, you can get a new passport in three hours. If not, it will take three days. Carry a prescription for eyeglasses in case you lose them or develop contact lens issues. You need the phone number of a medical doctor in your hometown that will accept you and transfer if you are injury, injured. This is very important. Medivac insurance that you should purchase, and SOS is considered one of the premier groups, will ask that you list a doctor who will accept you when you return to the United States. Many people purchase trip insurance as well. Medivac insurance is a medical policy that pays for you to be evacuated by jet to a quality hospital. Trip insurance reimburses you for the cost of a trip and your out-of-pocket expenses should you be injured before or during the trip. You should carry your yellow vaccine card, an international driver's license obtainable from AAA for $10, and sunglasses. The international driver's license is recommended both as a form of identification and should you decide to drive. Most violations on motor scooters outside the United States will result in your license being confiscated. Also other minor violations. Traveling on the plane, a neck cushion, inflatable is a wise choice. Earplugs, so you don't need to listen to the chattering of the caffeine intoxicated person next to you. A carry-on with fresh underwear and a small coat that will keep you warm. A hat. And you should probably label the outside of your passport with your passport number. Each time you take the passport out of its holder or your pocket, you risk the chance of somebody picking it up and stealing it or losing it. If it's labeled outside, you can often read it through a clear window. Magnifying glass and sterile needles are essential. Many trips result in splinters. Before leaving, get two extra sets of photos, and these can be used to apply for visas at the border should you decide on extra travel. Recall your ATM PIN number outside the United States must be six digits or less or it will not work. If you attempt to put a seven digit number outside the US, the machines usually will not take it. Finally, on the back of your credit card you'll see an 800 number. Tell them that you're taking the card outside the country so that when you purchase something abroad, the card will not be put on hold. Some miscellaneous advice follows. First, put all your liquids and paste in a clear bag for TSA. Make sure your medications are labeled. This travel vest was purchased on eBay for $12. It has probably 10 pockets in it, which can be crammed full of everything and essentially constitutes a small suitcase. The black terylene jacket folds up into a very small area and the convenient underwear is shown in the left pocket. Many people call this a convenience pack and individuals will sometimes mix their malaria pills with vitamin pills, with Tylenol, Please don't do this. Here is a passport with my passport number on the outside and a colored copy. This is an SOS card. Notice the numbers you call 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be sure if you are medical personnel to identify yourself as such when you call. Many people find that a passport and ticket holder that goes around the neck is very convenient. While this passport holder is on the outside, it is put inside the shirt afterwards, so pickpockets can't reach it. Essentials include your USF hat and sunglasses, a needle removal kit with a magnifying glass, and a collection of nice watches, none of which 
should be taken anywhere because they'll simply disappear. Sexually transmitted diseases are often encountered, encountered in travelers. People are probably less inhibited abroad. There's a sense of anonymity. Condoms are unused. Hooking up is fairly common. Be sure to use condoms if you're going to be sexually active and to always be aware of the risk of STDs. Vaccines are an incredibly complicated area. I refer you to the Centers for Disease Control website. Please review it carefully. Go over it with your physician before you travel at least two weeks ahead of time. The vaccines vary by region and this is the CDC website. Take a minute, take a look at it, and see what applies to you. We're all familiar with surgical prophylaxis for surgery. Why not medical prophylaxis for travel? Where are you going? If malaria is involved, malarone and doxycycline are wonderful agents. For GI protection, 250 milligrams of quinolone a day or zyfaxin can be used as prophylaxis. Doxycycline can also be used as GI and malaria prophylaxis and also protect against relapsing fever, GI disease, and rickettsial disease. Leptospirosis is also inhibited by this agent. Please pay attention to the latest travel guidelines for malaria. This is a serious illness and cannot be underestimated. There's a big deal made about chloroquine sensitive and chloroquine resistant malaria. When in doubt, I always prophylax a patient for multi-resistant malaria. Looking at this map, you see that China, a close neighbor of Laos, has chloroquine resistant malaria, whereas Laos has multi-resistant malaria. Sometimes the mosquitoes just don't read the sun axis. What medication should a clinician carry? Well, prophylactic antibiotics based probably on anticipated exposure. Ampicillin sulbactam, quinolones, or zyfa and zyfaxin, neosporin cortisone ear drops, quinolone eye drops, two z packs, and Tamiflu, the influenza medication, with one course for each traveler, especially if traveling to China or Southeast Asia. In these areas of the world, influenza is epidemic and it's essential that you promptly treat fever, cough, and backache consistent with influenza. Most physicians will carry a suture of 40 nylon with a P3 needle, some paper tape, and a small ACE wrap. For analgesia, a potent medication is recommended because some countries will not give pain medicine on an outpatient basis. Compassine spansels are useful for nausea and can be used in concert with a pain medication. And NSAIDs are useful for sunburn as well as muscle aches and pains. For GI, metoclopramide 